And welcome to another Kicking Up With Sensei. And today we're joined by self-defense expert, uh, Jeff Thompson. And Jeff's had a fantastic life and, well, a very interesting life, I suppose you would call it, Jeff. And you're very welcome on here today. Been around a few corners, as the Irish say. That's it, yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> if you'd just like to give the audience a little bit of background and to your story and how you got involved in martial arts in the early days. Um, I got started in martial arts, I guess, when I was 11. I uh, started in Aikido. Uh, you know, there was the big Bruce Lee kind of uh, rush. Everyone wanted to, I think, I think Enter the Dragon was at the pictures. And, uh, yeah. you know, everyone was going mad for Bruce Lee. So I joined uh, the first martial arts club I could find, which was Aikido, which was, there was no kind of karate at the round at that time. It all came a little bit later. Um, and I really excelled in Aikido as well. It was, uh, if, if I hadn't, I mean, I was, I, I was uh, groomed and abused by the teacher at the class. And if that hadn't have happened, I probably would have continued in Aikido because I was very strong at it. I was natural. Um, that interrupted my career, my martial arts career very, very early. Yeah. It left me with a very damaging schema. I didn't, after that, obviously, I didn't trust people. I never told anybody about what happened to me because I was too afraid. Um, and uh, I didn't want to draw any attention to myself. I was quite a sensitive kid. Excuse me, I just started um, senior school um, and I was struggling with that. I was like, you know, lost in this sea of otherness. So it was quite a very, very strange time. As it yeah. turned out, it was fortuitous. It wasn't at the time, it was damaging. It left me, as, a, as an adult, it left me psychotically jealous, uh, um, uh, cripplingly insecure. Um, but it also set me on a path of searching because after this abuse, I suffered with a lot of depression. Um, yeah. I suffered with a lot of self-harm, sexual self-harm, all sorts of things that I couldn't talk about at the time. Um, so I started to search for something that would help me to overcome that. So... Um, and it took me a long time, but it led me to the path I'm on now, which is just as a, a martial artist, but as, a, um, I, I suppose, a mystic, more, more into the mystical, more into the Budo, more into understanding, you know, how we can go into the um, unconscious, how, how we can individuate these things that happen to us, how we can take these you know, problems and these wounds and heal them. Um, and I, I've learned to do that um, through the pen. The pen is my resurrection stone. It's how I bring the dead back to life and process it into the consciousness. So it took me quite a long time to do that. So at my first, at my first uh, martial art was Aikido, which I loved. And I've got a lot of friends who do Aikido. Later on, probably a couple of years later, I ventured, in, I ventured into Shotokan. Um, with a couple of teachers, a couple of very legendary teachers called Mick and Rick Jackson. You perhaps wouldn't know them if you weren't Midlands based, um, but yeah. Rick had gone to Japan. He spent a lot of, he spent a couple of years over there. Um, and you know what it was like in those days, Emmett? If you went to Japan, you know, you come back, you, you were God, you know, everybody wanted <laughs> to train with you. And they were very, very powerful teachers. I mean, very physical. Rick Jackson used to work in the, on the nightclub doors in Coventry, as well as being a, a senior martial arts guy. So we were in the KUGB. So we, all my early grades were with Karazoe and with Anoida. So we had that JK influ, JKA influence, that Japanese influence very early on. The gradings were very, very strict. The training was hard. Yeah. In our class, it was a big class. Because Rick Jackson um, was a, a bouncer, he had a lot of heavyweights in the class. There was a lot of, it wasn't like just a kid's class. You know what I mean? There was a lot of adults, a lot of adults that were doormen, a lot of adults that were businessmen, a lot of adults that were criminals. It was a, it was a real, the very hardy bunch. So basically, if you didn't like a punch, you got punched in the face, you know. <laughs> and, uh, it was very difficult. I remember walking from my house in Walsgrave 
to Longford and it was about probably an hour's walk to train and then training and then an hour's walk back. And man, it was, I used to dread going sometimes because it was such a physical class. And so I went in to show to Cam. Um, I can remember some days lying on the bed crying because he didn't want to go. It was such a, such a tough ask. Then I, I kind of let go of that for a little bit. I fell in love with this with my first wife um, and fell away from the martial arts for a little bit and then ended up coming back to a thing called Mokgar Mok, Mok Kung Fu with a guy called Charles Chan. So I, I, I only went up to my purple belt in Shotokan at the time and into Kung Fu and got my black sash in Kung Fu. Um, but the Mokgar kind of... Um, dissipated um, so I went back to the show to can and realised again how tough it was and then stayed with that um, for quite a long time afterwards after, after that a bit later on I kind of went on the doors gave up my job started training in judo and Thai and wrestling started training in pretty much every, once I was full time I was trained in every different system um, but show to can I would say was my base Aikido was the beginning, and I loved the rhythm of that. I loved the Thai sabaki. I loved that whole movement. Um, I didn't, it, it wasn't, when I became a bouncer, I realised that Aikido wasn't, uh, it wasn't a frontline self-defence because it was too defensive. Yeah. Um, you know, you're constantly having to wait for someone to attack before you can defend. And, um, when you're in a real environment, that just doesn't work. You just you're just in the shit, you know. It's a, it's about preemption. It's about reading the situation. It's about seeing situations. Sometimes 15, 20 minutes before they even started, you know, your your conscious awareness really expanded, and you became you became a, a psychic. You know, one of the one of the siddhas or one of the Buddha techniques from being in very dangerous environments is that you are able to spot situations before they even arise. And you're able to stand in front of somebody and understand from their body language, from the mudras, um, from the nature of their speaking, <coughs> um, if they were going to attack, when they were going to attack, how they were going to attack. So you could preempt that, you know. So we were a bit like magicians, you know. We, we yeah. went through thousands of situations, personally hundreds of fights, not losing, not because you were a better fighter than the other person, but because you read the situation um, and you hadn't got the dogma of martial arts behind you, which was saying, don't attack until you've been attacked. Then you just, once you read the situation, you knew it was going to happen. You were preemptive. And we used, uh, we used precursors like dialogue to engage the brain. So we basically, you know, in some ways it was a bit like, taking a rattle off a baby, you know. Um, there was still the danger. It was still, there was still a lot of fear. Of course, you had to manage that. Um, and there was, you know, there was never a guarantee that what you did was going to work. It did work, you know, but there was, you know, every now and again, you'd, you'd bang somebody with the hardest print you've, ever, you've got and they just wouldn't move. Every now and again, you got a, you got a granite jaw who just <clears throat> wasn't going to fall over. But most of the time, uh, you know, the environment taught you up with. So that, I guess that was probably the most metaphysical experience of my life. My Budo was learned on a nightclub door because once you learn how to make things work in a real environment against people who don't want it to work and against people who are trying to harm you, once you make it work in those environments, and they were dangerous environments. I mean, <clears throat> I've said this a lot, but you know, just to stipulate how difficult it was, four of my friends were murdered during that process of time when I was working. So it was a real threat. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, what you, what you had worked, and once you knew what worked, and once you knew how simple it was, and once, you know, once you let the, the dogma of martial arts fall away and you sat with what actually physically works, you're suddenly able to see um, how you can let that go. Go okay. I know what works physically, but I don't want to be in fights every single night of the week. No, yeah. the, these aren't all monsters. <clears throat> some of these guys are factory workers. Some of these guys, you know, working offices. These are these are guys with families. 
children. Um, so let's try and use something more advanced. Let's try and get um, a bit more Kissinger, a bit more across the table negotiation. So I started to use badinage, started to use, um, um, in Aikido they would call it Kotodama Gaku, the use of sound or the use of magic sound or Heka, the same thing, the use of sound. So it's, we, we're using spirit in sonic form. So, you know, we, in the martial arts, we've got the spirit, we go, we do the ki, and we say, you, that's your spirit, use spirit. It's just sound. <clears throat> so we started to use sound in, in a way to, um, to defeat people without being physical. So either to talk people down or to posture and make them back away. So I started to experiment with sound. I started to experiment with mudras, with touch. You know, I could calm people with touch. I could calm people's adrenals with touch. I could trigger their adrenals with touch as well if I wanted to. Um, if I wanted to trigger the flight response and make people run away, I could use sharp touch. And if I do sharp touch, it would trigger the flight response and they'd, they would just automatically back away. Their, end, their um, reptilian brain would click into place and they just wouldn't want to fight. So I used to, I learned to master sound and to use sound. So it was less than about fists and feet and it was more about sound. So what I was learning using to um, harm people, I started to learn to use to heal people. So I started to use touch and mudras and sound um, as a process of healing people. This is a little bit later. So, um, yeah, it was, a, it was a shock to go on the door and as a second down and uh, realised that pretty much everything I'd learned wasn't going to work. Everything I'd been shown wasn't going to work. Or the distances were wrong, you know, the, the, the footing was wrong, the premise was wrong, the premise of, you know, no first attack. They always used to say there's no first attack in karate. <clears throat> so, um, you know, when you go back beyond the current day martial arts, people like Masashi and Sun Tzu, Masashi only ever worked with preemption, three preemptions, you know, we called it the three preemptions. So, you know, the people who'd actually been in combat, who'd actually been in war, knew it was about preemption, knew it was about being first, knew it was about artifice. And, you know, not just being first, but knowing where to hit, knowing how to hit. Not just knowing how to hit and where to hit, but being able to deal with the pre-fight fear, with the in-fight fear, <clears throat> with the post-fight consequence. Okay, knocking somebody out, but when they're lying on the floor, and, you know, their teeth are out and they're, they're in a cushion of blood and their girlfriend's screaming and the police to come in and you've been threatened with a Section 18 wounding and going to prison. You've got to be able to sit in a, in a jail cell yeah. and absolutely justify what you've done and deal with that and live with that. So um, the truth um, is all encompassing. You go on there to learn the truth of combat. You go on there to learn about what works. Um, and you find out what works, but you also start to realise <clears throat> you're in some kind of Jungian dream. You know, it's like recognising that all of these monsters, all of these people, they are projections from your own unconscious. There's a lovely line in the Tibetan Book of the Dead. It says, um, when you leave the body, uh, you'll be approached by devils and demons. He said, but don't forget they have devils and demons of your own projection, they're of your own imagination. <clears throat> and if you recognize that, they'll back away. But if you don't, they'll be incarnated back into that world. And it was the same, it was saying the same about life when you recognize that life is a mirror, it's a reflection. I was I was given a gift, Emmett. I was shown when I when I was on the nightclub door, I was shown this is the state of your mind. This is where your mind is. Your mind is full of threat. It's full of fear, full of danger. Because you're abused at 11. You believe everybody's a threat. You believe that nobody can be trusted. So you build up an arsenal. You build up techniques. You build up a body. And everybody becomes an enemy. You know, if you're a hammer, all you ever see is nails. And that's what I was. So once I kind of got a handle of the physical started to really go into it and think what's going on here what's happening here everywhere i go there's violence 
everywhere I go. It's my wife said, there's a common denominator. It's everywhere you go. Yeah. Whether I was at a wedding or a funeral, whether I was in the car, somebody wanted to take a pot. Um, and I started to think it's obviously something in me. And that was the big secret. That's when you're going into the Buddha. You know, when you start looking and thinking, uh, okay, if the enemy's in me, if the enemy's not out there, he's in me and I'm creating it, then I need to, instead of trying to fix the puncher at the level of the biggest bubble, let's trace it back to where the leak is. So I went inside and I started to work internally. I started to defeat my enemies on an internal level. This is what in Islam they would call the, the great jihad, the big battle. So, you know, that's where my martial arts is now. My weapon is my pen, you know. That's my, that's my spokesperson. It's my resurrection stone. It's my uh, direct line to a God or to unconsciousness. I use the pen if there's something I want to know. Or sometimes I'll use ves vessels like this. If there's something I want to know, something I want to understand, put myself in a situation where um, I'm talking to somebody else that needs to know. So we're hopefully we're talking to people that will watch this who are looking for information. So what I deliver will be brought forward through me for them. So I start to access new knowledge and access you know, the Buddha knowledge the, uh, the from the teacherless realm to bring it through for other people. But of course, as I process it, I learn it myself. You know, it's got to be processed through me. So, um, yeah, so it's still martial arts, whether I'm holding a pen or meditating, whether I'm hitting a punch bag, it's martial arts. It's still, it's the art side of it for me really now. It's more the Budo side of it. You know, I've no interest in, if, you know, if I ever got in a situation where I needed to be physical, it would be because I've made a big mistake somewhere. You know, I've fallen out of alignment. So, uh, but that's exciting. It's exciting to say to people, you know, your martial arts doesn't stop at the level of, um, sparring it doesn't stop at the level of being able to hit a pad hard um, or being able to put a choke on it's, you know, it's got to go way beyond that it's got to go way beyond that excellent and as someone who spent a lot of time on the doors and seen a lot of violence over the years and do you think martial arts instructors are teaching self-protection correctly in general or do you think that there is <clears throat> going far enough to kind of really protect people that are learning these courses and yeah, generally I would say they're not uh, from my from what I've experienced <clears throat> generally people aren't telling the truth and it's not because they're telling the lies because they don't really know the truth if you're still teaching you know defensive techniques then it's because you don't know the truth you know if you're still people teaching people to block and counter or to trap and counter if you're teaching people to go to the ground, it's because you don't understand the environment. When you understand the environment, you know that's insane. You know, that's, you know, everybody in that environment, in the security environment, knows that you never let somebody attack you first because that might be the end of it. And you never go to the ground. You, know, you don't go to the ground because the moment you hit the ground, you've got 10 people stamping on your head. And they're not, they're not you know, giving you a black eye, they're crushing your skull. You know, it's the most dangerous place you can go. This isn't to say that these arts are karate and, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of karate. I'm a big fan of all the different arts. I, lo I love them all, but, you know, I studied wrestling for a long time and I love those arts, but I still wouldn't go to the ground unless I have no choice. You know, we're not talking about a match fight in these environments. We're talking about an environment where if you do go to the ground, even strangers walking past you will stamp on you or stab you, or kick you in the face, you know, even ordinary people, I, I, I ended up making a mistake in a fight once, it was a match fight, went to the ground, it was outside a factory, <clears throat> um, it's, it's a story that I write about in my book, Watch My Back, where I got jumped on a nightclub door, so I found out where the leader lived, where he, where he lived and worked, I waited for him outside where he worked on nights in his factory. So I waited outside for him and I challenged him to a match fight. Anyway, I ended up uh, on top of him on the floor. And uh, the neighbours, just ordinary people from the, from the houses close by, came out. One of them had a screwdriver was going to stab me. Just a normal guy. 
was going to stab me because he thought I was the aggressor. This guy I was fighting really was a monster. You know, he was a gang leader. And uh, so you're not safe when you go to the ground. You're not safe if you allow somebody to hit you first because you're always, you're very, very rarely facing just one person. Um, so if you're facing more than one, and you allow one of them to attack, they, they're like a herd. They're just waiting for one person to attack. And that person attacks, they all attack at once. I've seen my friends who are really good, very, very good senior martial artists who have got completely destroyed in situations because they've just, they've just read it, misread it. They're waiting to be attacked. They're not reading the situation. Their instinct is saying attack first. You know, uh, attack is the best means of defense. They're, they're, their instinct is telling them that, but they don't listen to it because they've got the voice of their heritage in their head saying, don't attack first. You're a thug if you attack first. You can't qualify attacking first. So that's when me and Peter used to go out teaching. That's what we were teaching. We weren't having a go at other martial arts. We were saying to them, you know, you are not safe outside the chip shop on a Friday night with what you're doing. You just need to alter it. It needs to be adapted. It needs to, and it's not just about, it isn't just as simple as being preemptive. It's about understanding fear. It's about understanding your own adrenals if you're not used to it. And suddenly somebody in front of you is posturing and you get the flight response, a drop of adrenaline. All you're going to want to do is run away. And the chances are you, you will either run away or you'll freeze. Or you'll do what you've done is, and take up a stance. You do what you're trained to do. Um, and you have, suddenly have this um, logjam of thoughts and feelings and techniques coming through to your mind. But then suddenly it's over and you're lying at home in bed thinking, I bottled it. Or I got, I've come away with a bloody lip or I've come away with a broken arm or whatever. And that's, that's not what I'm trained for. I'm not trained for that. I'm, I'm a senior martial artist. That shouldn't have happened. Um, so most people are really afraid to look up, you know, they're really afraid to look at what works and what doesn't work because their whole martial art, their whole um, armory, their whole business is based around teaching a specific art. So they don't want to come in and suddenly go, which is what I did. First night on the door, I went back to my class and said, we're doing this all wrong. We're going to change everything. And we did. So uh, it's very difficult to come back to your class if you're running a, a five or a six or a seven figure company based around what you're doing and just say, we're changing this. This isn't honest. This isn't working. People are very afraid to look at the truth because the truth is going to affect everything they do. And suddenly you're thinking, well, I've got 20 or 30 years of training behind me and it's wrong. I've got to change it. Um, and I've got to come into my class and say, all that stuff we're doing isn't going to work. So it's recognising, as Peter always says, you know, it can be a recreational class. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. It can be, you know, a sport. There's nothing wrong with that. That's great. It's, why not? It can, it can be an art that's great. You can go into it just for the art. But if you're going to call it self-defense and not address self-defense, then you're in trouble because you're teaching something that isn't going to prepare people when it kicks off. And the problem is, you know, it, a lot of people go through quite a long period of time without getting into a situation. So they don't really know, really know what's going to work and what's not going to work. And until it happens, you, you just don't know. So, um, yeah, so when me and Peter were out teaching, me and Peter Considine, we, you know, we were just educating people, really. You know, and we were saying to people, look, um, this is what works. This is what's real. Let's tie this up in a bag. Let's get this complete. And then once we've got that, once we understand what works, I've got to sit there thinking all the time, what works, what doesn't work, what is a good art, what's a bad art. They're all good arts. All of them are good. I spent, yeah, I spent two, nearly two years full in full-time judo because I love grappling. But I still, wouldn't, I still wouldn't go to the floor outside in a situation. <clears throat> you know, it would, have to, it would have to be, if I went there, it'd have to be because I'd been pulled there and made a mistake. I wouldn't choose to go there. Because like I said, even, even the girlfriend with a hat pin or a pair of scissors will take a, will take a blade to you when you're on the floor. It's such a vulnerable situation. And the danger with it as well is that once you've gripped hold of somebody, you, unless you've been there, it's hard to explain, but 
frightened people have such a powerful grip. I had one guy that grabbed me. Again, I made a mistake. He grabbed me um, and I headbutted him and knocked him out. And he, his grip was so tight on me that he pulled my shirt off my back, literally pulled it off. Mm. You know, the grip of people, it's very hard to get their grip off once, once their grip is on. So we don't go into that environment unless we've got no other choice. And we certainly, you know, when, you, when you're in these real environments, this, the, the gap closes very quickly. You're normally nose to nose. So the idea of waiting to be attacked or, or, or having room to block encounter is nebulous. It doesn't work. So all you are left with is, be, is, the, is your ability to be able to control that gap, to control the gap. It, just understanding the gap is, is a quantum leap. Just understanding that there is a gap, that the person isn't dangerous, but what is dangerous is the gap between the two of you. And he's going to close that gap at some point and attack that. So you have to put something between you to control that gap. But he doesn't, you have to do it in a way that he doesn't know you're controlling it. Unconsciously, he will know he's being controlled. So we develop the fence, not just a physical fence, but also an invisible fence, <clears throat> sometimes a sonic fence, just using sound. But basically, you, you control the gap between the two of you. So that person had no thoroughfare. That person couldn't come forward and attack. Again, we're talking about martial arts at, 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 we're talking about combat at a, an advanced level and you only learn these things if you're in the environment um, and it's and it's not really the other people that teach you it's the environment go into the environment where where when there's a possibility that you might die the the environment will if you're open the environment will teach you what you need to do so the each environment will have its own egregore let its own overriding spirit and it's a very real conscious entity um, that is greater than the sum of all of its parts so everything that was ever learned about close quarter combat <clears throat> is in that egregore and if you're open if you go into it we'll say to you it will go okay this is jeff thompson this is how open he is this is how um uh willing he is um this is the pace he can go at and this is what we can teach him. So the environment will teach you everything you need to know. But you have to listen to it. You have to get rid of everything else you think you know. Because if, you, if the environment says this is what you need to do, and you go, oh, that's not what I've been taught, or that's going to go against what my karate teacher taught me, or that's going to go against what my judo teacher taught me, you're lost. Because in that moment of indecision, you, you've been battered or stabbed or whatever. You know. So the environment... If you go into the environment, I mean, it is, um, it is a baptism of fire, but the environment will teach you. And then the best thing you can do if you don't want to go into that environment is work with somebody that's been in the proximity of that environment, someone that's been in the environment. And then at least you can, if you trust them, you can learn from them and go, OK, um, uh, I'm going to avoid these situations if I can. I'm going to escape them. I'm going to try and talk them down. I'm going to do everything I can to avoid a physical response. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to at least do the rigor. I'm going to go away and say, well, what this guy's taught me is uncomfortable, but I'm going to go and test it. I'm going to go and find out whether it's true or not. I remember reading about Jesse Glover, who was one of Bruce Lee's kind of first students. Yeah. And he wrote a book about combat. And he, I've never felt, I've never read a book that was that, where the guy was so disappointed. He said, uh, I've learned all these arts. He said, I've learned all these magnificent arts. And he said, and I went and worked with some bouncers in, he's in America. And he said, and all they used was a big right cross. He said, everything I've done, he said, I don't need any of it. He said, I just needed that. And he felt like he was disappointed that that was it. That can't be it. But it was. But he shouldn't have been disappointed. He should have been exhilarated because he's found the truth. And that truth... Um, is a not it's a non-local power and it's not like a it's, it's a grace it's like a truth that comes in it's a they call it in spiritual buddha they call it a happy accident <clears throat> when it comes in you've got to grab it and hold it because once you've got that truth that truth will take you anywhere in the world it will speak in any language it will resonate in any room so once you've got that truth you can go okay all the other stuff there's nothing wrong with all that other stuff. It's fantastic. Some of my best times in martial arts, probably the best two years of my martial arts career, 
was when I spent 18 months training in full-time judo with Neil Adams. He had an Olympic class, you know, it was just like full-time players and he let me come and join them um, because we were friends. And it was an amazing, amazing experience. And that I didn't do that. That wasn't about self-defense. I knew what self-defense was. For me, self-defense was about avoidance, escape, verbal dissuasion, loopholing, posturing, anything but a physical response. If it was physical, it was preemptive. That was it. And then if I made a mistake and I fucked up, then I've got my support system of uh, grappling, etc. You know. So um, it's about it's about um, recognizing this. It's about recognizing what's true. And if you get that truth, that truth, well, like I said, I found a truth in a, in a tiny little nightclub in the back end or in the arse end of Coventry, a tiny little nightclub that was like a built like a cave. Um, and it was one of the roughest nightclubs in Coventry. Actually, it was one of the most violent cities in Europe at the time, yeah. in size and population. But that truth I found in that nightclub went and started to teach in my class and that truth was so potent as i said it's a non-local power it's an attribute it's an attribute from the divine um rippled out and ended up going across the world i ended up being invited to america twice by chuck norris to go and teach these principles to all of his black belts so when i had 10 days with with chuck norris twice i was invited well three times i was invited over third time I couldn't go. That's because that truth resonated. You know how it resonated? First of all, it went to Australia. And a guy called John Will picked it up. John Will's a, <clears throat> a legendary BJJ player in, in uh, Australia. Yeah. And he gave it to a guy called Richard Burton, uh, Richard Norton. And Richard Norton was a big martial arts guy in Australia. He was also in all the, all the Kung Fu films in America. And he was big friends with Chuck Norris. So he took my videos over to um, America and give them to Chuck Norris and Chuck Norris said let's invite him so it, it literally the truth is so potent <clears throat> excuse me it ripples across the world because it is so potent so Chuck Norris was really interested in me teaching about fear about preemption, about posturing he loved all that stuff in fact I actually seen an episode of Texas Walker Ranger <clears throat> Walker Texas Ranger where he does the posturing technique in one of the episodes, he actually does the ballooning and the posturing. Yeah. <coughs> so it's um. So what I'm saying is, if this is, if this was just about us talking about what works in a fight, we'd be in trouble because it would wouldn't be worth my morning. It wouldn't be worth your ninety minutes. What is powerful about this, Emmett, is that we can take this premise and say, well, if I can find the truth about combat about martial arts, about what works in a real fight. If I can find the truth in that, and it's obscure and it's hidden, because if you go out into the martial arts forums now, they're still arguing about what works and what doesn't work. There's still loads of discussion, and there's still loads and loads of classes around the world who are teaching recreation and selling it as self-defense, or they're teaching sport and selling it as self-defense. Or well, they're teaching art and selling it self-defense. So there's still not a clarity, even though the clarity is there. So, but if I can find the truth in that, then it means I can find the truth about relationships. I can find the truth about money. I can find the truth about business. I can find the truth about friendship. I can find the truth about uh, my own body or my own, I've got five bodies, my own five bodies. I can find the truth about my soul. I can find the truth about my own purpose. I can find out why I'm here. I can take that premise about learning truth and, and use it to understand Dharma, you know, the law. Why, what is the law of this place? What are the prevailing laws? Do I understand the laws? Do I understand how to work with the laws? And do I understand what my own personal Dharma is within that, within this matrix, within this, um, uh, within this huge matrix we call the great earth, do I know what my specific purpose is, is within that? So that's worth getting up in the morning for. So yeah. finding the truth about combat, I mean, a lot, of, like again, it, a lot of people can, can fall into the false belief that that's, what, that's all you do, that you've, you, you've learned about what works in a real fight and that's it. That's not the important thing. 
the important thing for me wasn't that I learned how to, what worked in a real fight, it was that I learned a truth. And a truth, a truth is like a hologram. If you break a hologram into 20 pieces, the full picture will be in each piece. So if I've got the truth about one thing, it means I, I've got the truth about everything in potential. Yeah. Well, I, can go out and, I can go out and use that uh, same methodology to find the truth, not, just, not even just about business and about money, because that's very much in the animal realm. It's very much in the, you know, the realm of you know, fighting, fucking feeding. It's still, about, it's still about living in the world. I'm talking about going to the human realm where we're starting to recognize that we're working with um, other powers, other energies at, beyond what we're talking about now. So what I learned on the door wasn't that, um, what I learned on the door was that I was projecting these monsters. I was forgetting that I projected them. Then I was learning techniques to defend myself against the very monsters I'd created and forgotten. Yeah. Once I recognized that, I stopped creating monsters. So it's that lovely saying, isn't it? Um, instead of trying to fix all of the three-legged chairs in the world, let's just make four-legged chairs. <laughs> you don't have to go out there and try and fix all the three-legged chairs. Let's just make four-legged chairs. So we don't have to go out there and combat all the evil. I just need to get rid of the evil in me or convert the evil in me as a raw energy. So I recognize that that whole environment was a projection from me. And once I realized that, and this is, I'm not talking metaphorically, once I realized that, <clears throat> I stopped giving my attention to those things. <clears throat> so I created infrastructure. I created people that wanted to fight. I created whole environments. Once I realized it and took my attention away from it, um, and attention again is one of the attributes of the soul. It's a creative uh, power. Once I took my attention away from it, the nightclubs dissipated, the enemies walked away. Um, in fact, if you went into Coventry now, I wouldn't be able to show you those nightclubs because they're not there. Yeah. One of them's, uh, some of them have been knocked down, some of them are houses, one of them is a hairdresser's, they're not there anymore. These environments, we, we create them, we maintain them, um, and once we understand that it's us that's doing it, we can dissolve them. Yeah, I'm not saying it's easy and I'm not saying I didn't make a lot of mistakes in the process and I'm not saying I did it quickly, it took time. But that's, that's worth getting out of bed for and that's what martial arts is. Martial arts is going, okay, this is the great earth. It is notorious throughout the universe as being a difficult environment. Even They say that even the Buddhas come here to perfect the way. That's how difficult it is. They come here to test their wilds. They come here to prove their technique they come here to perfect the way this is a difficult environment how more how much more difficult is it if we don't know the rules yeah. people don't know the rules people don't even understand reciprocity they don't even understand karma they don't believe karma and because they don't believe it they're constantly doing things that are creating a debt in the world that affects the world and then comes back to them and affects them so they're constantly being tripped up by their own karma and calling it fate and saying that the world is unkind and that, you know, that, that if there's a God, he's cruel. They don't understand that it's us that need to learn the, 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 uh, what the law is, the Dharma, and then what our place is within that. So most people are walking through a, an environment where they don't know the rules, they don't know the laws. If they do, they think they can trick them, which they can't. Um, and they don't know what their place is within that. So they're constantly offering a million different directions at the same time. So first we need to understand the law. And we need to get proof of that. It's no good me saying to you, karma is real. Reciprocity, cause and effect is real. You've got to do the rigor. You've got to know that for certain. Yeah. You've got to be brutally, brutally honest and go, yeah, that's how it works. Do the rigor, do the work. That might, that might take years of study. It might take years of experience. It might mean looking below the surface. It might mean no longer looking at what's on the news or in the newspapers, no longer listening to your friends around the canteen table. It's about going, you know, what's really going on here? Once you understand it, fucking hell, it's scary, but it's also exciting because you go, it's scary because you go in, uh, everything I think and say and do is a cause and it's creating an effect in the world. So I better be careful about what I think 
what I say, what I do. Um, but then it's also exciting because you're thinking everything I think and say and do has an effect in the world. So why don't I start thinking and saying and doing amazing things, great things? Why don't I just keep planting seeds in fertile soil by doing, the, by doing good things? Why don't I understand, learn to understand this law and love this law and be this law? That it's, this law goes out. Jeff Thompson's aligned. Let's work through him. Let's move through him. I haven't created... 50 books and 15 films and all these stage plays and thousands of articles, you know, because I don't understand law. I've, I've created them because I do understand law. I understand law and I have a very, very healthy fear of it. Because if I fall out of alignment and I do the wrong things, I will be assailed. So I've, I use the law to create content to put out into the world or to, as Rumi says, to put into the marketplace to leave for other people who might want to follow. You might want to try and find out the truth themselves. The truth is there. As my friend Wei Eel said, the truth is undeniably right in front of you. It's right there. But do we want to look at it? Who wants to look at it? Because if we look at karma and we believe it, then that certainly means that's all of the things I've done in the, wrong in the past. At some point, I've got to pay for. Nobody wants to believe karma because it means to acknowledge that what we did, what we thought instead and done, did before, has got to change. Nobody wants to understand karma because once you understand karma, you can't just sit and eat a steak anymore. You can't just sit and eat a chicken. You can't just yank a fish out of the sea and eat it because you're suddenly aware that these are beings, these are animals with souls, with, with uh, a, their own karma to work out. And when we kill an animal, the same as if we kill anything, it creates an effect, it creates a, our cause creates an effect in the world can't you know suddenly we have to be careful about every single thing we do we have to be able to look at ourselves in the mirror and go am i a fifth dan this is what happened to me 20 years ago when i got my fifth dan the master grade am i a fifth dan or am i just a fat overweight bully am i am i addicted to sexual pornography do i bully my wife which i did i would never have believed myself a bully but if my wife didn't want, if I wanted to cuddle and she didn't want to have sex, I'd be slamming doors. It'd be a cold back in bed. I'd be monosyllabic. Subtle violence to get what I wanted. I never would have seen that. Once you see it, it's shocking. It's shocking. No. And those things have to change. Not just that you have to stop doing them. You have to be able to say to people, yeah, listen, don't make me into a Robin Hood. I was a bully. No. Don't make me into some kind of Robin Hood character. You know, I kicked teeth out of nightclub doors. I stamped on people's heads. I was just an insecure bully, you know. So understanding the law, I understand why people don't want to understand the law because to understand the law means to change everything. It means to change everything. But that's also exciting because it's like, okay, I can, I can do something. I can make a mark. I can at least practice kindness every single day with my thinking, with my saying, with my doing. I can recognize where the real enemy is. And the real enemy isn't who we think it is. And I can start um, using this enemy to sharpen my own weapons, to sharpen my own tools, to find my own center. So it's, um, so at the lower end of martial arts, we know it's exciting. There's a lot of good stuff there, but a lot, I know for me anyway, for the first, until I was in my twenties, I was just, practicing things that were never going to help in a real situation yeah. when i became a bouncer i realized what was going to work and i just concentrated on that and then i then i started to go into the arts like into judo to wrestling into tie all of these amazing arts just because i love them they were great support systems as well but i love them as arts i love doing them i didn't do them because it was good for self-defense or because it was combative i did them because it was uh, just a skill that excited me but when you reach a certain level with the physical stuff, you automatically start tipping into the budo because you're sitting there thinking, well, at some point I've got to stop working out and I've got to start working in. Yeah. You know? And I know from your early life, you had a lot of demons that you carried on to your days as a doorman and the sort of violent behavior and the self-destruction you were going through at that stage. 
but how did you finally come to terms with that early abuse and kind of become the more zen person that you are today? Um, I would say it was through, uh, through rigour, through, through inner work, not outer work. So uh, the, the, the things that happened to me when I was younger triggered depressions. So I used to suffer periodically with very bad depression. And the depression would either see me in bed and frightened to leave the house or smashing the house up, you know, in, in angry rages, you know. But I've got no control. I was terrified of my own biochemistry. I was terrified of my own biology. I was afraid of the feelings that came. I was afraid of, uh, I was like Mesner when he was climbing ma uh, um, Manga for Bat. Mesner was this great mountaineer and he was trying to uh, climb Manga for Bat solo. And he said on this on his second attempt, he said, I was halfway up the mountain in a tent and the wind was trying to blow me off the edge. He said, I was too scared to get out of the tent. He said, I was too scared to go up. I was too scared to go down. He said, I was too scared to stay where I was. He said, I, he said, I was at that moment in time, he said, I was afraid to be alive. He said, I didn't want to be away from my wife. And I just love that. It's the opening of his book, Na uh, Solo, Manga Pabat. Yeah. And then I think, God, this guy, he's, he's, he's built like a piece of rock himself. He's, he's uh, the most charismatic man. But he was there saying, I'm afraid, I'm afraid, I'm afraid. So he said, I get out of the tent. I think, OK, I've got to do it. I get out of the tent. I tried to tend to put my backpack up. So I just walk and I just walk and I just walk. And then I realize that I'm walking back down the mountain again. I can't go up. And he didn't do it till the third time. He got it the third time. He said, the third time I didn't defeat the mountain. He said, the mountain let me climb it. The mountain gave me a pass. So I was like that. I was a man that was afraid. At, I was afraid to live. Every time I got to the periphery of my comfort zone, and I felt fear, and I was assailed by depression. It was like these energies were saying, you can't come through this fire and thorns and that preparation, that preparation. So I had this one particularly bad depression, and I've told this story a lot, but in case anybody hasn't heard it, but I had this very bad depression. And I just suddenly, this is when you're waking up at four in the morning in a cold sweat, and it's going to be a long day. When you wake up at four and you're depressed and you've got a demon in, in your chest and you're, you're, you can hear it and you're talking um, and you're, you are following your wife around the house like a puppy because you're so afraid um, and you feel useless because you can't even protect your own children. And, you know, you can, you know I can remember being in that place for weeks and weeks and weeks and months. And then there's just one day just thinking, I can't live like this anymore. I just can't live like this. I'm not having it. And I just, there was obviously a, a connection with my soul because my soul goes, oh, this, you know, this guy's completely surrendered. He recognizes he can't do anything. So it just gave me this idea. And this idea came in my head to, to write down all my fears, to draw a pyramid on a piece of paper and write all of my fears on, on this pyramid, least fear at the bottom step, worst fear at the top step and then just start to confront my fears one at a time that's what the idea came confront all the things you're afraid of go out test them so i started to write everything down on this fear pyramid the fear of spiders at the bottom the fear of violent confrontation at the top and i just started to climb the pyramid and a strange thing happened when i changed from fear to curiosity from fear to investigation when I stopped running away from the, the feelings and started to investigate them and look at them and examine them, um, they started to dissipate, they started to disappear, and some of them started to work with me. So I started to practice confrontation, desensitization. I would confront the fears and I'd get desensitized to the feelings or to the object. And then once I'd overcome that fear, I was climbing to the next step, and then I'd overcome the next fear. Obviously, the first fear was the fear of saying that I was afraid. I was a second down. I'm not supposed to be afraid. I'm supposed to be a god. I'm supposed to be untouchable. I'm supposed to, be, I'm supposed to have Teflon skin. But I was afraid. I was afraid of lots of things. Um, certainly didn't understand combat, and I was very afraid of that. So I started to write the things down. Of course, every time I climbed a step, my confidence grew. My consciousness grew because I suddenly understood more things. 
the energy, uh, the, 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 the object of my fear dissipated, it was liberated, but the effulgence, the energy that was, locked, that was locked into the fear came across to me and I expanded. So each time I confronted a new fear, I was a bit more aware, I was a bit more wise, I was a bit more courageous. I've got proof of efficacy. I knew it worked because I was doing it. But the brain has a strange quirk. It can't deal with fear and curiosity at the same time. So if we can start, in, if we can start to be curious about what's, instead of me running to the doctor about this feeling, why don't I be curious about it? Why don't I look at it? Why don't I examine it? This voice in my head that's telling me I'm a piece of shit, that's telling me I should be ashamed, that's telling me I'm not worth anything. Why don't I watch that voice? Why don't I look at that voice? That's not my voice. That's certainly not the voice of God, not the voice of anything kind. So I don't know what's that voice. Why don't I ask that voice to qualify what it's telling me? So I started to be curious and the fear really dissipated and my confidence expanded. So I ended up giving up my job in the factory, which was shift work, which I hated. I went onto the building site, <clears throat> started to learn a trade. Um, and at the very top end of the pyramid, I became a nightclub bouncer to overcome my fear of violence. <clears throat> but by that time, I'd grown a lot of confidence and my training was changing. And um, so although the fear at the bottom of the pyramid, um, are spiders and the fear at the top of the pyramid, violent confrontation, they seem disparate and they don't seem related. They're really the same. You know, they're only separated by a degree. It's exactly the same thing as confronting, sort of confronting something, <clears throat> challenging it, then show me what you've got. You keep threatening me, but let's come in, have a sit down, let's have a look at you. Show me what you've got. You keep threatening me. And what are you threatening me with? Of course, when you look at what fear is really threatening you with, it's saying, if you don't, you know, if you don't hide away, if you don't get medication, if you don't take a drink, if you don't hate yourself, we're going to attack you with more of the same feeling. So I go, okay, so you're just threatening me with more of yourself. But if I can become desensitized to those feelings, if I can learn to become comfortable in those feelings, if I can stop running away from those feelings, those feelings have no power. Those feelings can't live. They have no existence if I don't engage them, if I don't identify with them. So I started to practice uh, choiceless awareness. So I would just sit in the ark <clears throat> in the center of my being and I'd watch these thoughts, I'd watch these feelings and I just would watch them without making any choices. I'd just observe them and I recognized that they were outside of me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some of them had hubs inside me. Some of them had wounds inside that they were feeding off. But basically these feelings came from outside. So I just put a bouncer on my mind door and I just started to discriminate about who I let in and who I didn't. So then the big challenge was doing the door. Went on the door, then it was another massive expansion. Started to teach what I'd learned on the door. Another expansion, people wanted me to come and teach for them. I started to get invites from everywhere. People started to travel from across the world to come and train at my class in Coventry. Um, started to do um, reality training, animal day, line training, three second fighting all of these new innovations in martial arts, just to prepare people and just to give people a chance to test what they've got to see whether it worked, you know. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> so, yeah, so I, I, um, I started to exercise these feelings. <clears throat> I started to, uh, Carl Jung would call it individuation. These things that were hidden in my unconscious, these things that were repressed or suppressed or hidden, I started to bring them up. I started to bring them from the unconscious into the conscious. I started to write about them. I started to talk about them. I started to examine them. I started to go below the layers and try and find the source of them. So I started to write books and films and stage plays. And I wrote about the things that blackmailed me. I wrote about the things I was afraid of. So that became my battle. My battle was no longer with people on nightclub doors. My battle was with the thoughts and the entities and the pain bodies um, and the demons within me. I started to bring them out. And I recognized that most of them didn't really want to do battle. They just wanted liberation outside of me. They really wanted to be converted. So I started to get the positive side of me 
um, and I started to combine it with a negative side of me and I started to create from that place. I created light from that place, like a light bulb, negative, a positive terminal, a negative terminal, and they're joined together by the filament of the soul. And that's what creates light. So it became no longer became friends and enemies. It just became one cohesive force that created. This is it in process now. What we're doing here is that process. It's a part of me that would say, uh, really wants to do this interview. A part of me that was going to say, can't be bothered. You know, what do I want to do another interview for? And then the, the soul part of me that joins the two energies together to create, um, uh, like, you know, an hour talk or whatever it is that this goes out. Now, I'm not just creating a light. We are creating a spirit. Once we've recorded this, this will be a spirit that is recorded on the tape. So forevermore, people can access this somewhere in the world if they need inspiration. And the spirit that I've created or that we've created in this will enter them and they will become inspired. It might just trigger curiosity. It might just trigger hope. It might just break through layers of consciousness and say to them, you're not alone. There is a remedy. There is a way out. This is the role of the, um, uh, I suppose you call it uh, the returner. This is somebody that comes back, someone that's escaped from a, a burning building and, and as goes through a period of profound relief and then suddenly thinks, oh, fucking hell. I've got friends still in, that, in the building. I've got, loved ones in the building. I've got strangers, I've got people in the building who don't know how to get out. So uh, I think they, in Buddhism, they'll call it uh, a bodhisattva. So the bodhisattva goes back into the burning building and says, oh, by the way, not that I want you to follow me or buy a course from me or, or, you, know, or you know, profess me to be a living guru, but I found a way out. And if you want, if you want to come out, I can show you how I found it. Some people will go, don't believe you, do what you know, I don't want to come out, or <clears throat> you know, I'm too scared. But other people will go, I want I want to find a way out, I'm going to try it. So as a body sat fan, you go back into the burning building and you say to people, um, I found a route out of depression, of fear, of greed, of envy, of jealousy, of abuse. I've found a way to heal my wound. Um, this is what I did. Maybe it will help you. This is what Rumi calls. Uh, leaving your teachings in the marketplace somebody may follow um so <clears throat> i i found it i found this place by practicing forgiveness and forgiveness is about forgiving things from your mind it's about going in it's about finding the root and forgiving them from the mind in other words exercising them from the mind um clearing them from the mind and i do that i specifically do that through the writing and through the teaching Excellent, excellent. Now, and I know my first experience with yourself, Jeff, would have been animal days. And yeah. it was actually, I think I was looking for something within self defense, just teaching it now. I just thought it wasn't adding up with what I've seen outside of that. And how did animal days come about? What first sort of initiated that form of training? Well, you come off the door and you think, <clears throat> We do, we're not training right. Everything we're trained is organized and, and it's safe. And it might seem like it's dangerous, but it's, it, and it might seem like it's difficult, but it's difficult easy because there's still lots of rules. There's still lots of protocols. <clears throat> so I just thought I need to recreate a real situation for people um, so they can get to test drive it. So they can, it's like a pressure test environment. It's like putting an inner tube into water and pumping air into it to find out where the leaks are. So we created a pressure testing environment to show people where their weaknesses were, where their strengths were, what worked and what didn't work. So we tried to um, recreate a real situation in all of its details, even with the swearing, you know, with the posturing. We used to dress people in anoraks and coats and suits, um, you know, to, to, and put them, you know, put them in uh, clumpy shoes and then make them fight with no rules, no rules. Um, and just see what works and see what, you know, see how people felt. So it was really a method of pressure testing. I, I got quite a bad reputation at the time because people thought we were thugs. Um, we've got people, I got barred from certain places where I couldn't teach. Um, an MP, a local MP brought me up in Parliament because um, he thought I was a bad example. But 
we had doctors there, we had priests there, we had all sorts of people there who would, who would come because they wanted to work their stuff in a pressured environment. This was way before UFC and, and uh, you know, the Valle Tudo and all that kind of thing. This was kind of, you know, so I started to do videos and say, look, this is pressure testing. You think what you've got works. This isn't the real environment, but it's as close to the real environment as we can get without, uh, without actually being there. So it's a step closer. So we started to practice that. And then we started to show people how to develop spontaneous, you know, um, martial arts, uh, how to practice the fence, how to use dialogue, how to defend against dialogue, uh, how to understand fear, how to manage fear. Of course, the only way to understand fear, manage fear, is put yourself in a situation where you're feeling fear. Yes. Um, and again, it's not exactly the same, but we, we did make our, some of my students, people like Matty and Tony, we, who ended up becoming bouncers as well, they said um, our training was so hard uh, that going on the door felt easy for them because they, they weren't dealing very often. They were dealing with criminals and, and uh, street fighters, but they weren't dealing with highly skilled people like they were in the gym. You know? mm. They felt it was a step down. They felt that in that environment, uh, you know, against ordinary people was a lot easier. Um, so we just, you know, uh, we just created an environment where people could test themselves, where people could see whether their art was effective, whether it wasn't effective, um, not just to highlight their weaknesses, but also to accentuate their strengths. And it's just so they could look at it and get rid of what didn't work. So Animal Day became quite a big thing. And I started to do things, I did start to do videos on three second fighting you know this idea that um a, you know a real fight is probably going to be started and finished within a few seconds if you do it properly yeah. um uh you know it's not a match fight so i started to distinguish and say look this is a match fight this is a spontaneous fight this is a if you're aware this is a fight that you see coming this is how you prepare it so there was a whole other battle going on it was, but the main thing was teaching people to manage their nerves, manage their stress. Um, and then I started to write things like Dead or Alive. And Dead or Alive is a comprehensive book on self-defense. Um, um, and that was kind of talking about uh, pre-fight, in-fight, post-fight. Got the adrenal map in there. So the whole, a whole comprehensive look at what self-defense is, what self-defense isn't. When we were teaching all around the world, me and Sharon, we realized that most people were never going to do this. They were never going to do it. They're never going to be able to get it, the preemptive stuff, because it was um, uh, too much of a step for them. Recognize that if, you know, I was a skilled guy and I was training full time and it's hard to do. So I thought ordinary people who aren't training full time aren't going to get this. So we had to start teaching them something that would work. So instead of trying to make them into firemen, we just taught them fire prevention. So we started to teach them about awareness, avoidance, avoidance, awareness, escape, verbal dissuasion, loophole, posturing. We started to teach lots of techniques, basically giving people an awareness and saying, this is how it works. This is, them, this is the modus operandi of the general attacker. If you can spot him in his ritual, you can, you can stop it from happening. So we started to teach massive awareness about what a real situation was, how you're going to feel, and how uh, all of these techniques you're being taught aren't going to work for you. They're not even going to work for a, for a skilled person. Yeah. So we started to speak, if, if it became physical, we started to show people what would work. But even then, you know, I remember a guy saying to me, um, uh, I tried your preemption in the street and it didn't work and I said let me hold the pad you feel your punch and you threw a punch and I said well I know why it didn't work it's because you can't punch they just understanding preemption doesn't doesn't make you a good puncher I said you have to train for thousands of hours thousands of hours to get that right and to be able to do it under pressure thousands of hours um, and ultimately if you're going to want to make that work at some point you're going to have to take yourself into an environment where you're going to need to work it you're never going to know until you've done it. Only experience will give you that truth. But you can learn enough to go, yeah, that's, that's not how I want to live. I don't want to spend thousands of hours learning to punch someone in the face. So what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to perfect the avoidance. I'm going to perfect the escape. I'm going to make sure I really understand my environment. It's an interesting thing, Emmett. When we're teaching our kids about safety, we absolutely know about the predator. We know about his ritual. We know about where he hangs out. We know his environment. And we teach them how to avoid predators. And yet as adults, nobody follows it. Nobody does it. They just end up in all, you know, they end up in shitholes with shit holes with arseholes, you know. They end up in rough places. They end up walking across fields at night to take shortcuts home. You know, they end up <clears throat> in uh, getting in unlicensed taxes. They, all of the things they would teach their children never, never do. As adults, we do it ourselves because we think we're impervious. But as, a, as an elite martial artist, what I learned was that I am vulnerable. Vulnerable. As Neil Adams said to me once, Neil Adams is the, is the consummate uh, Neil Wazza player. He is the consummate ground fighter. And he said to me, I never show people my back, ever. In, in grappling, uh, you, you, you wear a grappling. Yep. You, wear, you, you understand grappling? Yeah, yeah. You do, yeah. So, you know, when you're in the kneeling position and, and someone comes around and, and hooks in and all the rest of it, Neil said to me, I never show people my back. He said, because even at my level as world champion, he said, if I show people my back and give people that advantage, he said, a decent black belt will be able to take it. So I love the idea that <clears throat> we don't show people our back. So we don't walk. I, I learned not to walk down a dark alley at night, even with my skills. I didn't put myself in environments that were where I was vulnerable. I didn't drink if I was working as a bouncer. You know, I was ultra careful. Even when I was going out doing book tours, I was ultra careful about where we walked, you know, when we were in different cities. You know where we sat in it. You know where I sat in a restaurant. So your awareness just—the biggest thing your awareness shows you. And I learned this from seeing legends lose their bowl, um, uh, lose a fight, lose their life. These are people that I work with. People that were legendary characters. You know, infamous fighters. And I watched people lose because they lost their awareness. So it, for me, it was about constant awareness. It was about not letting people see my back. Um, so, you know, then, then like I say, then you, at some point, it's very, very difficult because you build this armory up, you build this knowledge up and you build this position up. But at some point you have, you have to go because you, you start to get, you start to attract invisible teachers and te teachers from, they call it the teacherless realm. So they're not corporeal teachers. So these teachers will come in and go, this guy's exhausted the physical. And he's very interested in looking at something deeper. So then we start, the esoteric starts to come in, the Buddha starts to come in. And then you have to start letting go of all that physical prowess, all that physical armor. You have to break down the physical body, the ethereal body. You have to break down the mind body and the, and the intellect body. You have to take control of these <clears throat> different bodies and you have to access the soul. You have to become very vulnerable again in order to, to in order to, um, go to the next level so everything you learned has to be discarded and then you have to start again and that's really hard when you've used the physical body to protect you in real situations to suddenly go i'm going to wander around without that protection because i need to find a new protection i need to i would call it advanced restriction training so you restrict yourself uh, in judo they would call it giving up the apanyari in other words uh, you're a fantastic um, uh, with your, with your Kouchi, so I'm going to take that technique off you. You can't use it for a year, and that will force you to find a new technique. With by class, we used to make people sit on the floor and punch the pads, or kneel on the floor and punch the pads, or stand with their back to the wall and punch the pads, to force them to find another source of power. You can't use projection anymore. You can't use hip twist anymore. So we're going to have to find a new source of power. So this out helps them to attract key or chi. Right. So this advanced training that I was taken on um, was was uh, um, was an advanced form of giving up the apanyari. He was saying we've got to remove those things um, in order to bring through a new power, a new level of training. And then of course, if you want to, you can bring that stuff back later. You know, if I take your coach off you for 12 months so you're forced to learn a new technique when you come back the coach you're still going to be there isn't it yeah you're still going to have it you've always got it because you can do it with your eyes closed 
the, the idea is, is that you're constantly, constantly at the bottom of someone else's class. Excellent. And something I wanted to bring up with yourself today as well is how did you first get involved with Peter and the BCA and how did the BCA come to be? Oh, Peter changed my life because I was just like this rough diamond when I met Peter. Um, I, I, I'd written this book, Watch My Back, about my experiences, what, about the stuff we're talking about, about my experiences as a bouncer. And I was sending it to all the magazines in a, in a rough form, you know, printed form, but not wasn't uh, published at the time. It was going to be published. Just to ask them to interview me about it, I, I had this intention to, to publicise it in all the magazines. And I went to Bob uh, Sykes at MAI, and he said... Um, our self-defense guys, Peter Considine. And of course, I knew a Peter. He was quite legendary by then. Yeah. Um, you know, he was, he was kind of one of the pioneers of full contact karate. He was a senior grade. He was like, you know, one of the, um, uh, he was one of the doyens of martial arts, you know. So I went and met him up in Leeds and he interviewed me. And we, he ended up demonstrating techniques with each other on the motorway services or by Leeds. And, um, we just really hit it off. I just loved him. I loved, I knew he was this god of martial arts, but I loved how humble he was. When we did all the photographs of the magazine, he wanted all of them to be me hitting him. You know, I just, I thought that was very humble. I was really impressed with that. I liked his bluntness as well, because he looked at my manuscript. He read it. He said, he really liked the book, but he said, who's going to tidy it up for you? I said, what do you mean? He said, it's a bit of a mess. You know, grammatically, it was really bad. I liked his directness. Um, anyway, he was he was working as a bodyguard at the time. And I said, look, you know, can I send you a copy when it's printed? He said, yeah. He gave me his address where he was working in London. And I sent him a copy. And I think he must have been impressed when it landed because he perhaps, like most people, perhaps he thought it would never get published because it was a very niche book, you know. Yeah. You know no one had written about, um, I think there'd only been one book before about being a bouncer by a guy called, Cliff Kremlo, um, and that was like 20 years before. So it was like, um, I don't think he expected it, but when it came through, it was really beautiful. It was a really nicely published, published by a company called Somersdale. It's a very professional job. Anyway, he rang up and said, this is really good, I really like it. And then he, he uh, got in touch with me about two weeks later. He said, look, you know, I'm starting a self-defense association. Do you want to come as a chief instructor? And of course, it's like being invited to play for United, isn't it? You know, go, being a chief instructor with Peter Considine. And uh, when he, I said yes, but when he asked me, I was really nervous because it just suddenly felt out of my depth. I suddenly thought, oh, fucking hell, you know, this man's established. And I'm just, I still felt like a, a rough club second down, you know. Um, so I said yes, but I didn't really want to. I was a bit nervous and I just thought, I just didn't think I knew enough. And then I just thought, well, I know how to have a fight. And that's all I'm going to be teaching. I know how to do that. I am absolutely certain about that. I'm doing it every night of the week. I just thought I'll stay with my strength. And Peter taught me how to use money, how to build a business, how to um, invest the money, you know, mostly in, in human capital. So I invested it in my own training, in my own reading. Um, in, I've got the best equipment possible when we went teaching we had bags full of pads and we, I invested in doing videos and stuff with him and it was Peter that got me to do my first video I was so nervous doing my first video that I had to talk past the camera to Peter um, and of course once I got going I was fine but <laughs> um, so pretty much everything I know really is what Peter taught me because I was very rough and I was very uh, um direct you know, if you look at the early stuff my early stuff it was direct you know a lot of people were offended and rightly so because it was blunt you know i was at a stage where i was quite insecure as well so i would just say listen if you don't believe me come down and come to the class come and see me it was you know i was, I was basically challenging people it was silly but everything it was insecure but P peter kind of helped to refine me he encouraged me to study more to build my mind body just, just running the business and dealing with money and setting up courses really set me on the path to much bigger things. Because working with Peter, setting up courses helped me to later set up my, I set up a 32 city court to, um, court, um, tour to publish my 
uh, re-release of Watch Your Back. We sold about 100,000 copies. So it's um, everything, I've, everything I've learned from Peter. So I, I, he, never, he never considered himself my senpai, but I considered him my teacher. I did. He was considered my mentor, you know. Um, and we didn't have that kind of relationship, really, but I always looked up to him and I always um, considered him to be my mentor. And I still do now. You know, I still talk to him on the phone. Um, and he was a good guy to ring up and uh, if you're struggling with stuff, you know. So, um, yeah, so I, I learned a lot. I learned all the, all the stuff I needed to learn to, to put my stuff into the world, Peter taught me. Because he'd been a businessman, I think he'd, had two very successful businesses. Um, he'd run nightclubs and stuff. So we understood business. So he taught me all that. He learned, he learned me that as we went, you know. And we were great together. We were a good match because he was very articulate, very smooth, very cultured. And I was rough. And the, between us, it was a good balance, you know. Yeah. Excellent. Peter's a fantastic fellow. Now, and I know his wife, Dawn, as well, is very Yeah, they're brilliant. Very intelligent. Intelligent. And, so, uh, and finally, I know you're involved in counselling now and helping others overcome demons. And how can people contact you and get more information on that side of things? The only, the only way people can get in touch now is through my Instagram page. It's Jeff underscore Thompson underscore official. And I've got a girl, a uh, very close friend of mine called Gabriella, who runs that for me. If, you, if you'd be kind enough to let her add this interview, Afterwards, that'd be great. Oh, she'll yeah. promote it. So um, I'm concentrating mostly on my work and my writing. Um, I'm, I've uh, had a bit of a sabbatical for quite a few years. I'm just uh, edging back into the world again. So um, the only place people can find me officially is at the Instagram page where anything I'm doing, anything that's going on is on that page. So we put, on, we put out free content every week on that page. So anybody that wants to read the stuff, uh, watch. I've done a lot of interviews. They can watch the interviews. Um, we've done lots of stuff on there about the books. And they can, they can get me through there. Excellent. I'll put links in the description there. And I'd also like to thank Gabriella for making this interview happen today. You know, it was... uh, she's a good girl. She looks after me. She runs all of my social media for me. Because it's not, it's not really where I want to be. I don't really want to be on social media. So I, I limit myself just to Instagram and yeah. Gabriella runs all of it for me. She just takes all the correspondence. It just allows me to concentrate on where I'm strong. Yeah. Which is the writing, the interviews, I just concentrate on where I feel good. I don't want, I don't want to be on social media every five minutes. You know, it's, uh, it just dissipates my energy. So he's been really kind to me. That's it, yeah. And it was a pleasure speaking with you today, Jeff. And thank you very much for coming on. It's a pleasure, Emmett. I really appreciate you inviting me. Thank you. And it's hopefully it'll go out and it'll uh, we'll plant a seed somewhere. That's it. Yeah. And all the best with your future projects. And we'll chat soon. Thank you. Thank you, Emmett. Lovely to speak to you.